service also to key population. Uh, for instance, a key population can knock on the door of the nurse by 1 a.m. in the night and is also able to assess uh, prevention to um, treatment services, testing inclusive. For the commitment to um, uh, human rights, um, Hadland Alliance uh, uh, has a, a pool of um, human rights officers who are also uh, trained um, lawyers uh, who have trained um, key population community members on paralegal services. And um, we also uh, provide um, uh, ADR services and um, for those uh, that are being arrested, and also do, uh, carry out um, legal representation in Nigeria for key populations that are being charged um, to court. We also train um, healthcare workers on the uh, provision of uh, key population uh, friendly uh, services. And um, we have also a standardized manual for these key population healthcare uh, uh, services. Uh, for uh, for healthcare workers. So if a key population is not accessing services in his home or in the one-stop shop, even at the um, hospital level, the government hospital level, those um, healthcare workers have been trained to provide key population um, friendly um, services. And um, also a commitment to to human rights, okay, I, I spoke about that, and commitment to community uh, empowerment. Um, currently, Catlin Alliance have mentored um, 32 um, community-based organizations, um, and, and, uh, and on the current project, we are supporting 17 um, uh, key population-led organizations with um, sub awards. And, um, most of this, uh, all of these organizations, let me put it so, uh, some of them started as group of friends, uh, but um, uh, we've built their capacity through our standard um, uh, capacity building model called the Greenhouse uh, Strategy, where um, we, uh, at the initial discovery stage, we have to embed those uh, uh, staff of the key population um, organization into a different unit in the organization and we get to give them sub award, a uh, mock sub award after two years and then we now have them go and open their offices. All these key populations, uh, are, uh, these organizations are key population led organization, meaning uh, a full MSM organization with the executive director, the MI officer, the accountant, the care and support, all of them members of the uh, MSN organization, same with FSW, same with people who inject drug, same with the transgender uh, person. A total of 16 questions with a score of um, 78 points. The scoring process was a consensus. I think I've mentioned that. Uh, oh, sorry. So in conclusion, um, our model, our greenhouse model, uh, a mentorship model, has a midwife, 32 key population, uh, community-based organization, of which some are currently uh, implementing multiple uh, program with multiple local and international uh, uh, donors. And also, lastly, inclusion of key population as members of project management committee, as well as uh, support to uh, key population uh, network, which we also uh, uh, mentor to um, support the uh, coordination process of the key population organization uh, in Nigeria. Uh, all right, so I will just um, thank you. I will use this opportunity to appreciate USCID Nigeria for this um, wonderful um, uh, template and uh, um, specifically to uh, AOR Isa Iotim, is in the hall. I want to thank you because he brought this template as far back as 2009. And these are the results that uh, we are having today. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you, Paul, very much for that. We're going to move all questions to the end just to try to make up some time. So I'm really excited to introduce um, Ruben Frescas. He will present on the community public partnerships that help effectively and efficiently utilize 
contributions of the community to address public health needs. Um, so Dr. Rubin is a board certified family medicine, um, MP he has a board certified in family medicine with an MPH, and he is the deputy chief of party for the USA Bladders Project um, at Life Center. And he also supported WHO as a consultant, and prior to prior, he held a faculty, faculty position at John Hopkins Medicine. So we're excited to have you present. Thank you. Hello, good afternoon. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, and I have the privilege of being able to share uh, the experience from the Vietnam team on this uh, community public part uh, public partnership uh, model uh, to help bring uh, efficiency and contributions of the community to public to meet public health needs. Um, in addition to HIV, uh, also this model was used to help respond to the COVID um, uh, response in in Vietnam as well. So I'll talk a little bit about that also. Um, just to give you a little bit of context about the, um, the HIV response in uh, Vietnam, uh, the uh, epidemic there has the brunt of the disease burden being faced among key populations there. So most programming is, is very focused and targeted to reach this particular group. And among the KP, the most significant part of, uh, uh, of the population that is affected uh, is the MSM community. Uh, so one of the uh, things that um, the organization had recognized years even before being involved in the current Ladders project is the importance of engaging uh, these community members um, uh, and through the uh, partnerships with community-based organizations, particularly KP-led uh, uh, community-based organizations, we were able to have a common conduit in which to engage and have uh, optimized outreach among uh, key populations. Uh, again, there's a lot of barriers, vulnerabilities, and stigma to go through. So by working with already established groups um, that, uh, that have these existing networks, we were able to leverage some of the work that we were doing programmatically to make sure that interventions reach these groups effectively and efficiently. Um, this slide just gives you a little bit of an, uh, of an idea of the uh, extent of the, the work that Life Center is engaged with. Uh, in addition to the USAID funded project, we also receive funding through the Global Fund, uh, where we're supporting 10 different provinces throughout the, the country, uh, culminating in the 44 community-based organizations that we help support with over 300 outreach workers um, in order to produce the, the work and engagements that we're doing in Vietnam. So the community public partnership model uh, is a very specific way of helping to engage community-based organizations in a structured, organized, facilitated, and supported partnership, not just with um, the, the health facilities, but also with the provincial CDCs and the provinces in which we're working with as well. So um, we have three specific steps in which we engage with these partnerships. The first step is on a uh, provincial agreement. So we make uh, meetings first with the uh, provincial leadership at the CDC office uh, there in order to get their buy-in, their understanding, uh, and their support in engaging the partnerships then between the community-based organizations and the public health facilities in which those community-based organizations will be working in parallel with. So that then brings us to step two, uh, the local engagement. So there's a landscaping uh, uh, analysis that is done to look at the community-based organizations working in the provinces and districts of interest um, following discussions that we've had with provincial CDC. From there, we also speak with the health facilities that service those communities and populations. And then we bring both of those entities together so that they have a common understanding of what the CBO brings to the table, what the health facility brings to the table, and the expectations between the, the uh, mutual relationship and working relationship between these two. And then from there, we move on to step three, which is a formal agreement between what the roles, responsibilities are of the community-based organizations and the health facilities. So here you can see on the slide uh, a few of the key facets to this partnership. Uh, there's coordination between the data that is shared between community and facility in order to help facilitate the linkage, care, and treatment for clients referred to those facilities, 
but also we use the data to help understand who is it that we're reaching, and more importantly, who is it that we're not, that we also need to, uh, to extend services to. Um, this data sharing is extremely important. Uh, we do deep dives with the provincial CDC as well as with the participating health facilities to understand who is accessing the services there and also eliciting what feedback can we do to optimize and improve the services both at the community level and at the facility level. This allows us to improve quality control checks um, and include the client perspective in that uh, engagement as well. And then I'll talk a little bit about the model and how it was used uh, specifically uh, on the COVID response as well. Here, just to highlight an example of one of the case studies between one of these partnerships, we have Bien Hoa uh, Health Facility and Swan Hop uh, and GNET CBOs that help to filter or feed uh, referrals to this particular health center. So here we can see that uh, during uh, the previous two fiscal years, uh, over 200 clients uh, who were screened and found reactive in the community were referred and linked to care within the health facility. Over 700 uh, clients were supported with both ARV and PrEP adherence support from the community to the health facility to make sure that we reduced and mitigated loss to follow-up. Over 200 clients were referred to be enrolled into PrEP. So this is a huge contribution from the community to the facility in order to help do some of that legwork. Uh, at the same time, the health facility also provided technical assistance and updates from uh, the providers to get, relay information on new uh, practices, uh, 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 counseling tips for the outreach workers that are working in the community. So this brings both the uh, health providers from the facility into the community and community workers into the, the health facility in order to optimize the experience for the client. Um, as I said, this partnership model can extend beyond HIV as well and was actually utilized as part of the COVID response in Vietnam. There was a very uh, severe lockdown, which I'm sure many countries had faced. Um, in, in this instance, uh, there was military enforcement to make sure that people weren't leaving their homes. This then presents a, a difficult uh, case for how we can get drug distribution to clients that need to be maintained on their ARVs and on PrEP. So we utilized the outreach workers, advocated them to have um, uh, protection with the vaccine, along with other healthcare providers, in order for them to be able to deliver the medications to the client's homes. And you can see that there was a significant contribution to maintaining adherence support through this model. Uh, in addition, the public health sector also requested for our outreach workers to help support the actual testing uh, in the communities uh, as well. So not only did they provide ARP adherence support, some commodity support, but we also provided support to respond uh, to testing services in the communities. Uh, and here we can see the impact of this partnership. Uh, as the number of partnerships had grown, you can see here we go from 12 back in 2017 up to 28 just this past year. The contribution of the uh, number of cases referred to the health facilities has grown with the number of partnerships. Uh, and if we look a little bit closer at what the impact is at the districts in which we're working, we can see that the contribution of clients that are connected and linked with both ARV and PrEP are significantly uh, impacted through the partnership model. So in both Ho Chi Minh City, one of, one of the, uh, the largest metro areas, uh, and in Dong Nai, one of the neighboring provinces, the majority of clients that are linked to care are linked through this partnership model. Uh, in addition to the partnership with the health facility, we also acknowledge that it's important to have partnerships with other areas as well, business, uh, factories, industries, universities, colleges, as well as other uh, parallel government uh, ministries and sectors. So we partnered with the Ministry of Education and Training, for example, in order to have extended outreach and connection with universities. We also worked with one of the labor uh, uh, unions and departments in order to help engage with uh, uh, private sector industry in order to bring the services to the employees uh, in, in some of these areas. And that was important because we found that migration patterns of where um, people were coming from and where the, the actual uh, HIV case was being found were two completely different locations. So that this helped inform how we can then extend response into other provinces as well. The other part of this model is also to ensure that we uh, have um, uh, optimized uh, uh, financial capacity building 
for the CBOs engaged in this model in order to have financial sustainable development uh, for these organizations to continue doing work even in the face of decreasing donor funding. Um, here, just leave you with one last slide, seven key lessons learned uh, through the partnership. Um, establishing client-centered collaborative activities is extremely important to then carry out those activities in a way that is responsive to uh, this specific community. Delivering the services uh, effectively and efficiently through these organized uh, and uh, directed partnerships uh, is extremely helpful to make sure that they're facilitated. Encourage uh, uh, innovation in collaborative processing uh, among partners as well. Because there's trust between both the health facility and the CBO, their working relationship is a lot more fluid. Um, the periodic uh, review of uh, data and input from the client also helps strengthen the partnership, makes it more responsive to client needs. Uh, and uh, the, the partnership can be leveraged uh, to help to respond to a number of public health needs. HIV is the primary purpose, uh, but we also saw that it can be beneficial for other emergencies such as COVID. So with that, thank you. All right, thank you, Ruben, Dr. Frescas, that was excellent. Um, moving on to our last presenter. We actually have an online presenter. Uh, this is Dr. Abbas Zazai from Namibia. He's a medical doctor and public health specialist who has worked extensively in Zimbabwe and Namibia before joining InterHealth Namibia as deputy chief of party for the KP Star Project in February 2021. As the deputy chief of party, he is responsible for the project's technical oversight. And today, Dr. Azizai will be presenting about improving viral load monitoring coverage using a CQ CQI approach for this KP-focused program. So Dr. Azizai, are you with us? Yes, good afternoon. I hope you can hear me. We can hear you. Welcome. Thank, thank you so much and I uh, appreciate the opportunity to share with you what we did under KP Star Project funded by USAID in Namibia, implemented under Indra Health Namibia. Just as a bit, as a bit of background, the project is implemented in 10 urban settings of Namibia, selected on basis of prevalence, high prevalence of HIV, as well as uh, high numbers of key populations. Key populations targeted by the project include female sex workers, men who have sex with men, and transgender individuals. We he started implementing the project in the middle of COVID. COVID was actually hitting us hard at the time that we started implementing the project. But despite this, the project started on a very high note. We managed to initiate a number of key populations on ART through a team of dedicated peer educators. This is a community cadre, as well as case managers who are also based in the community but interacting with the facilities and an online platform. Of course, with time, we started monitoring our viral load for clients on ART. We noticed that although we achieved viral load suppression rates of over 95% in some cases, our viral load coverage in terms of monitoring remained low, sometimes very low, below 60%. Initially, because of the restrictions of COVID, because of the prioritization of COVID testing in, in, in the country, viral load monitoring became something that was a matter of a luxury. So it was suspended for a while, but even after the, the, the moratorium was lifted, we continued to observe that our viral load coverage was low. We needed to find out why it remained low, despite the improvement in circumstances around testing. We did not think it was the ministry. We did not think it was ourselves, but we wanted to find out. So we set out to find out. Can you go back to the slide? Yeah, this one. Ah, no. Something has happened to the slide. They've moved so fast and then. Um, yeah, I apologize, Abbas. We're having some technical difficulties with this session. Okay. Uh, the slides, no, that's fine. hopefully we'll be with us in a moment. 
Okay, that's fine. But you are doing a great job speaking even without the slides. So I know it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Oh yeah, the slides are coming uh, back. Yes, so we 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 the second slide, I think. Can we advance? Okay, yeah. No. Is that the right slide? Yes. Great. All right, over to you. So, yes. Pause. Our intention was to find out what was causing this sustained low viral load coverage in our prior geographical areas or in our in our sites. So we, the management of the project divided themselves and went to all the 10 prior geographical areas. And we met with the uh, facility staff, including the Minister of Health and Wellfish Bay Corridor Group, which is our clinical partner, just to, to have some frank discussions on why we had low viral load coverage in their facilities. We reviewed and we updated some case management files, just to, to look at whether they were complete, whether there was any missing information. We also looked at the patient care booklets, and uh, we looked at the results from the laboratory. There's a, there are files kept in the facilities. We just wanted to see if these sources of documents were talking to each other. We realized a few issues there. In some cases, we could find that the, the, the results were not filed in the case management in, in the patient care booklet, which unfortunately would be used by the, 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 the data clubs to enter into electronic patient management monitoring system. So in our in our in, in our quest for, for answers, we could already see that this is something that could be fixed. So we went ahead and interacted with the, the facilities to find out what could have been the challenges in completing this, some of these uh, these documents and filing. And of course, what came out clearly was that uh, there were shortages of staff in, in Namibia. At the moment, there are quite some shortages of staff, particularly trained for staff like nurses and facilities. Now, we also realized that we had case managers who were located at facilities who could also assist in doing some of the manual stuff like filing of uh, results, filing of records and all that. So we, we, we agreed that this could be done. And across all PGS, this became some sort of collaboration between project staff and ministry staff, as well as the World Bank Ecology staff. So we managed to, to ensure that all the, the, the results are filed appropriately. And uh, we interacted with the, the data clerks. And they could then update the electronic patient monitoring system that is in use in the country. Having done this, we then went on to look at the changes, comparing the first three months of the year, January to March, and, uh, and uh, April to June. Then on, on your right on this slide, just to show some of the sites that, that, that we, the sites that we work in, the, 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 the dots there are estimates of the key populations in the, in the in the areas that we work. Next slide. So these are some of the results that we then would like to share. There was a stark difference between what happened between January and March, where the viral load coverage was around 65%, compared to April to June, where it shot up to 90%. When you're right, is the same information now shared by private geographical area or by site. You will see that overall, the, the, the orange bar, which is supposed to show us the, the, the second period, April to June, is significantly better than the blue bar, which is the period between January and June in terms of viral load coverage. Not only was this evident throughout the PGAs, for these periods compared, but it was also noted that the viral load suppression rate did not significantly change between the two periods under review. So it put to rest some of the worries that we had earlier that maybe our viral load suppression rate that we are celebrating of 95% does not 
based on a low viral load coverage, might not be a true reflection. So we, we, we survived this time around. We hope we'll be able to continue to, to, to demonstrate a high viral load coverage as well as a viral load, a high viral load suppression rate. Next slide, please. So some of the things that we then set out to continue doing after after the, 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 the exercise, we to say beyond this, this exercise that we conducted, we wanted this to continue. Our, our case managers, these are project staff, would continue to work with the facility staff, the nurses and other staff in the facilities to ensure that the filing in the patient care booklet is up to date all the time. Our case managers are also collaborating with data clerks to update the electronic patient management system that I mentioned earlier, so that at least when they enter data, they are entering data that is up to date from the source, the patient care booklet. Case managers are sending out reminders to clients for viral load monitoring. Sometimes our clients lose track of time and they may forget their appointments. So our teams are actively engaging with clients, reminding them of their appointment dates. And this is something also happening through the, 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 the <clears throat> online platform that we use called QuickRest. And this can also continue to be done at facility level, even beyond the pro project, working with the facility staff who are going to be oriented on QuickRest. Our regional coordinators, who are the supervisors of the case managers in the various PGAs, are meeting with facility staff at every opportunity. We set out to do these meetings once every two weeks, but at any other opportunity, they are supposed to meet and interact and ensure that our records are up to date. The regional coordinators are now providing monthly reports to the Minister of Health just to advise them of any gaps that may exist so that they can take corrective action. And they're also sharing the same reports with the project management so that we can immediately identify and fix any, any gaps that may be existing. During our supportive supervision visits, we are encouraging our staff, regional staff, as well as head office staff, to always look at documentation related issues and try to find solutions before they leave the site. Our KP staff has organized. The project has organized case management trainings for all case managers, tracers, and project officers and program managers just to remind them. Some were trained earlier, some came later, they never got a chance to be trained so that they could do case management properly. If they do it properly, they would prioritize documentation, they will make sure every step that has to be followed, they understand why they are doing it so that they have an interest in knowing what is happening to all their clients at all times. In conclusion, we identify some gaps in case management through the quality improvement, uh, continuous quality improvement initiative. We think that uh, suboptimal documentation may be addressed through continuous quality improvements if it is done regularly and uh, on a sustained, a, a sustained manner. Quality improvement indirectly addresses low viral load coverage in project sites. But we think this is something that can be extended to other facilities beyond our project site. The, the initiative fosters collaboration of project staff and ministry. We also noted that there are a lot of other staff who are not necessarily clinically trained or nurses by training who are available, who can be used, who can be utilized to assist nurses in places where there's shortages of staff so that they can do other manual stuff that can assist in producing quality as well as making sure our clients get the best out of our services. We identify as a project that case management, including documentation at facility level, is an important ingredient in achieving true 95-95 targets. There is just one of our colleagues, the case manager, going through patient care booklets, making sure that the records that are in there are in keeping with what is in their own case management the documentation or file. I thank you.
Great. Thanks so much, uh, Abbas. Uh, yeah, I love these presentations. I think they, they, they look at KP programs and some of the sort of pain points that we've seen over the years, viral load coverage, community public partnerships, establishing KP competency of local partners. These are all reasons I think we wanted to have these models shared. Um, we do have just a few minutes left for questions, so would love to hear questions for, from the audience if any of you have those. Yes, Amelia. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much uh, to all the presenters. Is this working? Okay. Uh, just thank you very much for the very interesting and compelling presentations. I did have two questions. Uh, my first one is for, um, you mentioned that when you're doing the um, assessments that there is a, a process of coming to consensus to develop the score. And I was wondering what happens when you don't have consensus amongst the assessment team. How, and if you could talk a little bit more about the process of getting to consensus, especially if people maybe disagree on, on what they're looking at. I was, that was my first question. Um, the second one, um, Dr. Rubin, thank you very much. I was wondering if you could speak a little bit more about the role of um, mental health care, um, especially for uh, the young key populations and the role that that's played in helping, particularly post, um, well, I don't want to say post-COVID, we're still in COVID, but after those very intense lockdowns that Vietnam went through, um, how the provision of mental health services really helped to re-engage, particularly the young MSM in services. I wonder if you could speak a bit more to that. Thank you both. All right, thank you um, very much. Um, the consensus was based on um, uh, the evidence that the assessors um, saw. I mean, from both uh, physical and hard copy um, evidence. And um, actually, we never had uh, a disagreement on what, uh, because we always do, what do you think you score yourself? You score yourself. We say, we score myself 100% because you said uh, our composition of both. Uh, we have key population members on the board, and we showed evidence. You made a call to the person, and the person said, yes, I'm a member of the board. So what do you think? 100%. And and, and so um, that's how um, it went. And at the end of the day, we uh, uh, both ends were happy. Great. Thank you for your question. Um, with regards to, to mental health, um, uh, this this was actually uh, a, a very important uh, intervention point for us because uh, a lot of KP were left with no social connections other than what they were able to leverage via digital platforms, social media, etc. So one of the interventions that the community-based organizations had organized in collaboration with LIFE are, were a series of um, virtual events, uh, virtual social events, virtual um, uh, uh, discussion topics on a number of issues. This helped to keep populations engaged in a period of time where they may be the only person in the room uh, to connect with a wider community, remind them that they're actually connected to a wider community of people. Uh, and because the community-based organizations have their own social uh, activities, connections, and work at hand as well, it really turned out to be a huge lifeline to clients. So this was a medium that we used not only to communicate the needs that, that uh, clients needed during this particularly stressful time, um, but also as a conduit for them to have social connection interactions uh, to keep mental health uh, at the forefront during a very difficult time uh, otherwise for, for clients. Once things started to open up, because we already had these established connections and through the virtual events that were, were put forward through the, the organization of the community-based organizations, we were then able to leverage those connections and those networks that we already had to then bring clients into the health facilities. So when we looked at the data, we had a bump um, following uh, the, the end of the lockdown period. Uh, when you compare that to the rest of the trend and even to the prior year's uh, uh, performance, it exceeded, but it was artificial because this was essentially a bump up from a period of time where there was a lag in any response or in any service provision. Sorry, um, in addition also, um, uh, uh, 
there is um, a, a project advisory committee, and it's made up of the key population community members. And um, the project, or the, uh, let me call it the organization, is also accountable to the community through that project advisory committee. So um, how are they involved? We, we meet two times in a year, and we give accountability to the community. In as much as we owe the board also explanation, we also owe the community through the project advisory committee. So with those kind of evidence, the picture evidence, the reports of those meetings, um, the, it was easy for the consensus to to uh, 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 to be uh, uh, to go. That's a great addition. Um, more questions? Uh, thank you for the presentations. I have a question for our Nigerian colleague as well. Uh, it's impressive the results that we're talking about, but I was wondering uh, when you talked about your door to door approach, looking at the sensitivities around religion in Nigeria, some parts of Nigeria, and uh, the sensitivities around uh, KP itself, or if you managed that? Yeah, I, I think um, to even uh, be uh, stigmatized, uh, the uh, the, I may say that some of the facilities may be, may be stigmatized, but the community uh, focal service provider, that's what we call them, that goes door to door. Uh, we, are, we, we do uh, 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 implement the multi month uh, um, um, scripting. And, uh, you know, you get somebody three months, six months, you don't always go uh, to check on um, uh, the uh, person except maybe after two months, you do other services. Maybe you call to find out how the person is doing. But when the time comes for refill, you can pay that person a visit after uh, uh, six months. And um, except the person calls you to come, oh, I'm having issues, uh, those and so health challenges, and then uh, you go. This kind of strategies has helped us um, to, to beat some of those um, um, stigma and those a kind of crisis in the community while delivering our services to the key population. I know that we're at time, um, but so feel free if you, you need to leave, but are there any other questions? Mm -hmm. Thank you so much to all the presenters. Um, I'm truly fascinated with the assessment that you did in Nigeria, Paul. Uh, my comment is, from the assessment that you have, uh, the questionnaire itself, do you think there could be an, intersec an intersectionality with community-led monitoring, whereby you have the community actually doing the assessment to see if we are KP competent? If, if you could just quickly reflect on that. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Actually, uh, the, the methodology involved um, uh, the, the, the PEFA, we, the staff of Hadland, and the community. So it was not we and the PEPFA, it was also uh, the community. So they ask us, this is uh, what, uh, they, they ask us a question, when we respond, they ask the community members. And it was a combination of all the representative of, of, the, of the key population uh, community from the transgender to MSM, FSW. So it was a very wide audience that we were being assessed. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions? Mm -hmm. uh, Paul, you generated a lot of interest, and I'll also pose a question to you. Um, so it's quite interesting, the assessment process that you did. But I'm also keen to understand on follow on. Right, uh, follow on both for those that would have been assessed as competent and also follow on on those that would have probably gaps are noted and remedial actions. So for those that would have ticked all the boxes, were there any subsequent assessments? How frequently? And uh, how were those structures? Because my assumption is the structures that were there need maintenance of some sort and a regular check if they were still existing or falling off. Then for those who did not qualify, what then what follow-on procedures uh, uh, were instituted both by the community, uh, the, 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 the implementing partner, and the government to ensure that they also reach, uh, reach that level? Thank you. 
Uh, thank you very much. Um, the questions were 78 questions on, um, on um, 16 um, domains. And um, uh, we actually scored 100%. I thought you would clap for me too. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, since I think we're at, we're over time and thanks for everybody for staying because I think the information and questions have been helpful. I'll hand it over to my co-moderator to close us out. Innovations and KP programming that we're seeing. Um, and I think we've that they more than delivered in these presentations. Um, we're definitely going to be sharing the slides out. I apologize, apologize profusely for the technical difficulties today and the amazing job our presenters did working through those challenges. Uh, but yeah, fortunately, the slides will be available as part of the master slide deck for the um, the entire conference. So yeah, there'll be opportunities to to to, to review and and share more. But yeah, thanks again, everyone, and have a great rest of the evening.